our next speaker in this contest is a doctor in the Japanese philosophy. And he will be talking about error domains in Go, which were introduced in Go 113. So that's interesting. Let's take a look at Carl. Hi, I'm Carl Johnson, and this is Mastering Your Error Domain, Graceful Error Handling in Go. About me, I'm the Director of Technology for Spotlight PA. Spotlight PA is an American nonprofit newsroom dedicated to producing nonpartisan investigative journalism about Pennsylvania government and urgent statewide issues. You can read my writing at carlmjohnson.net, or you can follow me on GitHub and Twitter. Has this ever happened to you? The other day, I was reading the web, clicking on links, as you do, going down one rabbit hole after another, uh, and I came across a blog with a he historical fiction, uh, a diary account of Captain da Costa, who's a Black Portuguese sailor from the 17th century, born in slavery, but gaining his freedom and visiting Japan. Um, based on true historical materials, uh, interesting stuff, um, but my blog reading experience was interrupted by an unwanted error message at the top of the page. It said, uh, warning, continue targeting switch is equivalent to break. Did you meet? Some quick searching online revealed that the error message was caused by a mismatch between the site's versions of PHP and WordPress. It seems that older versions of WordPress had a bug in them with a certain switch statement uh, and then later versions of PHP dump a warning about this kind of bug out to the end user HTML. When I came back to the site a few days later, it had been fixed, presumably because the site had been upgraded with its WordPress version. Although disturbingly, uh, a number of people online recommended downgrading the PHP version as the fix. Uh, a bug in a WordPress site was the proximate cause for my being interrupted by the error message, but the ultimate cause of the warning is that PHP has both too many ways to deal with errors and too few. And as a result, an error message was presented to blog readers that they couldn't possibly do anything about. Luke Plant wrote a good blog post about a different WordPress bug where he says, built-in PHP functions and therefore any PHP project have a whole range of error handling mechanisms errors, warnings, returning error values, and exceptions. At every point, calling code needs to know which systems will be used to handle errors. In this sense, there are too many different ways of dealing with errors, and as a result, programmers sometimes let errors fall through the cracks. But in another sense, there are too few ways of dealing with errors, because what was really needed in this case was a reliable way of signaling to the person managing the website that they should upgrade their version of PHP, of uh, WordPress. Absent that, the warning was instead just dumped onto a random page for any passing reader to see. But of course, ordinary readers have no way whatsoever of acting on the error because they don't control the web server. Only the actual webmaster would be in a position to actually fix the bug. Ben Johnson, no relation, wrote an excellent blog post called Failure is Your Domain. In it, he notes that errors perform three different roles within a program. Some errors are anticipated are anticipated by the application and can have pre-programmed responses, such as a retry or logging the error. Other errors are meant to be presented to the end user and let them know that their input was invalid or that the system cannot process their request at this time. Finally, some errors are intended for the operator of a system and they're meant to enable more detailed responses, such as diagnosing and fixing a bug, upgrading a system, or replacing malfunctioning hardware. 
Creating reliable software then depends on our ability as developers to create an error domain, which correctly categorizes failures into these three different roles. Otherwise, we end up with absurd situations like this, where an end user gets a message intended for the operator, which they have no way of acting on. Or vice versa, in some, in some situations, an operator may get notified that a user presented invalid data, but of course the operator has no way of correcting that data. Uh, and then finally, uh, there are many cases where an application uh, can automatically handle uh, the failure, but unfortunately it's all too common that the automation is not done and operators and users find themselves just mechanically pushing buttons in response to errors. Uh, just as we know that developers should create a domain logic to encapsulate their business requirements, uh, failure is also part of the domain, and it should be a core part of modeling what your application is and does. Okay, so that was a little bit about PHP. The point here is not to say that there's anything bad or wrong with PHP, because obviously many great web applications have been built using it. The point is that in Go, we like to do things a little bit differently. So how is it that we would be uh, handling errors in a Go application? Well, of course, everyone knows that Go programmers handle errors by typing, if error does not equal nil, return nil error. It's a meme, but it's a meme because it's true. Uh, if you program in Go for any length of time, you will end up typing this out more than once. Uh, and you probably will have uh, some macro in your IDE or text editor uh, that lets you quickly auto-complete it because you know it is something that comes up a lot. That's not to say that there's anything wrong or defective with Go as a programming language. Rob Pike, one of the creators of the Go programming language has a great quote. He says, values can be programmed. And since errors are values, errors can be programmed. Because errors are just normal values instead of a special form of control flow, they have the same flexibility and inflexibility as other values. While it's true that Go has both errors and panics, and panics do work essentially like exceptions in other languages, Go encourages programmers to use values of the error interface type for expected problems, which means they can be programmed and abstracted around just like any other data type. This leads to the meme and the reality of if error does not equal nil, but it also allows for experimentation and novel application architectures without having to wait for explicit support from the language itself. Just as you wouldn't expect the language to provide a different way of returning an integer versus returning a string, errors are just ordinary values and they can be returned and dealt with in ordinary ways. They can be added into slices, put into maps, sent over channels, and whatever else you might do with an integer, a string, or any other value. The error interface is deliberately simple and it imposes no particular behavior requirements. All it takes for a value to be an error is to have a method for returning an error string. This allows programmers to easily create their own error types with the data and behavior that is relevant to their particular project or application. Go is a statically typed language, but the, pervasively, the pervasive use of a deliberately simple interface for errors allows for runtime run dynamic introspection. The dynamic nature of errors can lead to problems if misused, just like in other dynamic languages, but overall it has allowed for a number of community experiments in annotating errors. By using type assertions and runtime introspection, developers can look at a given error and see what concrete type is behind it, and then build new behaviors on top of that. Prior to Go 1.13, a third-party package from Dave Cheney called PKG errors became very popular. Using this package, it was possible to extend your errors by adding more information without losing the underlying cause of the error. It was possible for a third party to do this, to add this kind of feature to errors because errors are just ordinary values. And so a third party package for dealing with errors can handle them without requiring any particular language, any particular change from the language itself. The PKG errors package became so popular that it was decided to add a similar mechanism to Go standard library. Starting in Go 1.13, which was released in 2019, errors can now optionally have an unwrap method that returns their parent. Doing this creates a linked list or a chain of error value parents. This chain can then be inspected with errors.is to see if any value in the chain is equal to a particular target value. For example, you might want to use a certain sentinel value to trigger certain application behavior, but you might still want to be able to annotate the error with additional context information. The chain could also be 
inspected with errors.as to see if any of the parent values in the chain is implemented by a certain concrete type or implements a certain optional interface in addition to the basic error interface. The docs for errors.as give the example of inspecting the return value of os.open. The errors returned by os.open are implemented by os.pathError, and by turning the abstract error interface into the concrete os.pathError type, it's possible to retrieve the path or operation that caused an error. Note that the else clause here allows for additional unexpected errors to still be captured correctly. Uh, one of the nice things about using the error interface is that precisely because it doesn't attempt to encapsulate all possible return values like an enum or um, a, a type union in some other languages, it allows for errors to grow as an application grows. Let's go back to Ben Johnson's proposal that failure is our domain and take building a command line application as a concrete case study to see how we can use errors.as to add domain information at the boundaries of our application. When you run a process in a Unix-like system, it has an exit code. A zero indicates that the program ran successfully, and any other code indicates a failure. There have been various attempts over the years to standardize general purpose exit codes, but none of them have really stuck. For most programs, they only end up using zero or one, uh, but many programs do have their own custom set of codes. For example, curl defines 25 as meaning upload failed. It defines 47 as meaning too many redirects and so forth and so on up to exit code 96, which curl defines as quick connection error. The exit code package is a simple library that I wrote to help you create your own command line interface in Go, which returns a proper exit code. Of course, the simplest helper would just be a function that returns zero if the error is nil and returns one if it's non-nil, but we can do more than that thanks to errors.as. Package exit code documents a coder interface that extends the error type. To be an exit code.coder, a concrete error type just needs to have an exit code method that returns an integer in addition to the standard error string method. Other packages can create their own error types with an exit code method if they want to, but package exit code has its own set function that lets users quickly add an exit code to an existing error value without having to create their own new type just to have the exit code method. Then using exit code.get, we can retrieve any exit code associated with an error, or if an error has no exit code associated with it, we can still get one back for error present and zero back for nil. This would let us implement a range of error values in our command line applications, just like curl has, by associating known error values with the correct exit codes. Package exit code is a simple example of what's possible by treating errors as dynamically typed values, but we can take it even further. As I was building a web application with Go to create an HTTP JSON backend, I thought a lot about what the domain of my errors for what the domain of errors for my API was going to be and what the different roles they played were. As I worked on it over a series of months, I realized two things. First, that my failure domain just was the set of HTTP status codes. And second, that in the majority of cases, but not quite all, my user message was just going to be a restatement of the status code. Web standards like RFC 7231 define a number of different codes like the well-known 404 not found status. And then there's status 200, which means okay, there was no error. Uh, there's status 400 for bad request, but that means that there was a validation problem with uh, the request made by the user. Uh, 401 unauthorized, 403 forbidden. So those are both about authentication and um, authenticating. Uh, we have 502, bad gateway. That's when you're trying to connect to another server, but for some reason, the other server doesn't uh, give you a good response. And finally, there's 500 internal server error, uh, which is the status code you use when something has gone wrong on the back end and you don't necessarily want to reveal the details of it to the front end. I wrote package rest bearer, response error, with these realizations in mind. Package rest bearer defines two interfaces to extend errors one for HTTP status codes and another for user messages. It's similar to how package exit code uses its coder interface to define exit codes, but an important difference is the relationship between the two interfaces in the rest bearer package. The HTTP status codes have default user messages associated with them already. Those are the reason phrases that are defined in the RFC. 
Go provides a function to look up the status text from a status code. So putting these together, restbearer.user message returns the user message associated with an error. If there's no message found, it checks the status code associated with the error and returns that message. Meanwhile, restbearer.status code returns the status code associated with an error. And if it doesn't find a status code, it returns 500, which means status internal server error. Uh, and it also returns, of course, status OK, 200, uh, if the error is nil. So let's look at a demonstration web API that uses this package. First, we'll need to write a short helper function to let us send errors to our logging system and capture them while also returning them to end users. So you can see here, uh, the first line says log error. Then we get the status code out of the error. We get the message out of the error. Then we reply JSON sending uh, the status and message with the right uh, status code to the user. Then in our handler, we can call the helper anytime something goes wrong during a permission check, a validation, or database retrieval. So you see here, first we check the permissions with has permissions. If there's an error, we reply error, uh, calling the helper we showed before. We validate it by using get item number from requests. And again, if something goes wrong, we can use the helper. Uh, and then we get the item out of the database. And if something goes wrong, reply error. If nothing has gone wrong, then we're finally in a position to return the thing that the user asked for. Uh, and so we reply with the status OK and the actual item requested. At an application level, we know that a SQL error no rows error means that the requested object was not found. So we can just convert it into a 404 error uh, for item not found before returning it to the handler for further processing. On the other hand, if we get an unexpected error from our database, uh, such as connection errors or something going wrong, there's the table is missing, um, it will automatically be treated as a 500 internal server error by the REST bearer package, which means that proper logging and alerting can take place for the error. For permission errors, our boundary functions can convert authentication failures into errors marked with 403 forbidden. Uh, but for validation errors, we can go ahead and add more extensive messages. So in this case, you can see that it looks at the uh, query parameter uh, n. And if the n is missing, it says, please enter a number. Uh, and then if it turns out that the n that's provided is not a number, it says input is not a number. Uh, and in both cases, it associates it, associates it with the status code status bad request. Um, so that's how I made package exit code and package rest bearer. But the great thing about this pattern is that it's widely applicable. You can make your own package to handle domains that already have their own error codes, such as gRPC, FTP, SMTP, LDAP, CORBA, even SOAP. Um, if your application has its own unique set of failure modes, you could also just make up custom error codes for your application and use errors.as to encode and retrieve them. Aris.as makes it easy to create your own error systems that work for your particular applications, users, and operators without being straightjacketed by the language into a one-size-fits-all approach that inadvertently exposes your users to internal operations of your system. Don't let your users be distracted by irrelevant warning messages, as particularly when they're just trying to read a historical fiction account about swashbuckling 17th century <laughs> sailors in old Japan. Um, handle errors properly by thinking about their roles and domain within your application. So that's my talk and thank you for listening.